Uh, much like question time, of course, we will have our questions put to the panel. Uh, we'll go around the panel and as many people as we possibly can in the time allocated. But if you want to back up perhaps one of the questions, maybe with uh, a point of your own on the same issue, then feel free uh, to put your hand up. Um, let's have our first question then this evening, which has been submitted by Adam Goodyear. Adam. Does the panel agree with Nicky Morgan's recent opinion that the arts and humanities subject restricts the future options students have, or is her view deluded and out of touch? Uh, the idea here that uh, too many pupils were choosing GCSEs early on that were based around uh, the arts and humanities, um, because they were seen as the most useful for all sorts of jobs. Nicky Morgan, are you deluded? Are you out of touch? That's the first. <laughs> I firstly, um, thank you, um, if that were my view, then I think it would be the wrong view to hold, but that isn't my view at all, because actually I am an arts and humanities uh, graduate, and uh, that's what I studied at school, uh, and I did plenty of art and drama and everything else before I became a solicitor. Uh, I assume that people who are to have a view uh, like that about speech have then read the whole speech and realised the context in which I was delivering it, which was a campaign to get more young people particularly girls, to study uh, science and math subjects because I do feel uh, that girls in particular sometimes write off those subjects too early on and then discover later that the jobs they would like to have done, which did need some science or maths further study, actually uh, are not open to them. What I want to see is young people getting the best advice early on about the subjects that they need to take in order to fulfil uh, their ambitions. And I think it's also worth noting that, of course, we're going to move in 2016 to the Progress 8 measure, where we measure students' achievements over eight subjects, not just the, the five A star to C, including English and Maths. And, of course, um, up to three of those uh, areas of the Progress 8 uh, can very well be arts and humanities subjects. So I think a broad and balanced curriculum, including arts, humanities, sciences, uh, but, of course, including those important subjects, English and Maths, is absolutely vital for our young people's future. Um, Samantha. Uh, well, thank you for clarifying the, uh, the context there, Nick. I think that's quite important. Um, I do think it's a little bit at odds with the cuts to funding that have been happening in recent years, particularly with regards to music tuition um, alongside the uh, disproportionate 40 numbers that we've seen in teaching hours and teachers in design, technology, arts and humanities subjects. And I wonder if perhaps we could reassure people that the things that you're saying now about wanting to provide a well-balanced and rounded education is actually going to be backed up by investment in those areas of education which we know actually really benefit students in the long run. Well, we have put uh, money in. I mean, last summer, one of the first things I did as education secretary was to announce a further £18 million for the music clubs around the country. Uh, and earlier on this year, with the culture secretary, I announced a new content for the GCSEs for arts uh, subjects. Uh, and I do agree with you. I think that design and technology is extremely important. I think that's the way in for many young people uh, into uh, subjects that relate to uh, technology. Uh, I think we have some fantastic examples here. So um, I would refute the argument that the fact there's anything to do with the funding, uh, but I do want our uh, young people, I say, to have broad uh, career choices and subjects open to them. Uh, Christine, there was an 80% increase in students taking on arts and humanities subjects between 20, uh, 2002 and 2012. So do you think it has a point, or is she deluded out of touch? I think there is a, there's certainly a perception amongst very large numbers of members of the MUT that there has been a downgrading of art subjects. Uh, I was talking today, in fact, with someone who'd been uh, off in another part of the country examining drama where currently 70% of drama is examined on performance and only 30% written and it's about to switch completely the other way around. And I would say for a country that prides itself on our terrific cultural background, that's entirely the wrong thing to be doing and that we shouldn't have that rather mechanistic approach to the idea that we have to have terminal exams for everything. And that, uh, and that either continuous assessment or practical ways of examining or the wrong ways of doing them. But I, 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 I'd quite like to have the opportunity for you to say something about another speech you made, Nikki, which was the speech you made at BET, where you said, you know, we've got all this destination uh, information about where people go after school, and we will be putting that into the leave tables, and in future, we will be able to link that to people's tax positions so we will know which courses are worth taking. 
Now, the fact is that there may be very many people who choose to follow both in-school and then in higher education, an arts-based course, a drama course, and music course, who frankly may never make very much money, who may never tip into the 40% tax bracket, but who will A, be immensely fulfilled, and B, will be contributing probably quite enormously either to their local area or to their national area, uh, to the national life and so on. So I think, I think really that there are some things which are being said about arts <coughs> education, about what we would think of in the ABT as a liberal education, a wide ranging education, that, that are giving, you know, if, if what you said earlier is right, that I think your government is giving the wrong message. That if your message is arts and humanities are very important, then that isn't what's coming across. And it certainly isn't the lived experience of many teachers in many schools who feel that their subjects have been, uh, have been completely sidelined by the way that they're being dealt with through the curriculum. So, you know, I would be delighted if on Monday we hear more things from you about the about importance of these things, which is, of course, not to say that we think that STEM subjects are unimportant, and of course we want girls and women to be doing those things if that's genuinely their choice, but they shouldn't be pushed into it because somehow they're considered better. And I just say this finally, there are jurisdictions in Europe where it's perfectly possible to study medicine at university without the range of sciences that we currently consider absolutely vital to medicine here. Because actually the overlap between some of the things that you might do at A level in terms of science and what you might do in medicine at university is not that great. So actually doing art, doing humanities and arts doesn't necessarily close any options, even medicine if you live in some countries. Um, Carol, I'm interested to hear from you as somebody who works in the arts. Do you think that the arts and humanities subjects restrict future options that students have? Absolutely not. Oops. Absolutely not. Um, I think the Department of uh, Culture um, and Sport not so long ago um, actually gave up official statistics as to the massive contribution that arts and culture makes to uh, GDP, something I think they threw a figure around something like eight million pounds an hour, and gave out huge statistics about the jobs and the employment um, that, that happens in the UK. And if you look at 2012, which was a kind of pinnacle for this country to show the world how great our arts and culture is, I think for young people, um, there's also more opportunities now in terms of harnessing young people's entrepreneurial flair. Uh, I'm somewhat saddened that ideas tap is to be no more. And so, um, actually, the, the evidence doesn't actually back it up. It makes a huge contribution to the British economy, uh, arts and culture. And um, the, the wonderful thing about it is if you give uh, some investment, you get threefold uh, value added back. Everybody knows if you give an artist £100, you're going to get £300 of value. And you give a civil servant or a local government officer the same £100, and they'll come back and take a thousand. We need more. But I'm just making the point that um, it is a viable choice to work in the arts and humanities, whether it's music, drama, or whatever it is. We are seen worldwide as leaders in arts and culture, and frankly, we need to make more investment in it. I would like young people to have the choices that I had when I was at school, to have a completely rounded education so that they can make really informed choices. And we should be celebrating our arts and culture in this country, not downgrading it. And we should be employing more teachers that are able to offer it and also more links with artists in the community. Great art for all should mean that. Have their options restricted in the future if they don't look at other alternative subjects? 
Well, I think what this debate highlights is uh, the importance of a broad and balanced curriculum. And that's a, that's a phrase that sort of trips off the tongue quite easily these days. But it's important to sort of go back a little bit into the history of it, because in a sense it was a feature of the national curriculum, which was introduced in 1988. And, and that was a reform that I welcomed in many ways, because uh, it talked about an entitlement, an entitlement to a broad and balanced curriculum. It wasn't actually new. If you were a teacher in Leicestershire uh, at around about that time, Actually, a feature of schools such as this was that they had a broad and balanced curriculum because there was a strong commitment to developing a comprehensive curriculum that maintained uh, opportunities for all. And the reason for, to maintain that breadth, breadth and balance was that so that people would have choices later in life. Because what we know is that if we open choices up to youngsters, they almost always make choices that reflect and reinforce divisions based on gender, social class, and other differences in society. So we get a much more uh, divided and sense of polarised uh, outcomes where we, where we have choice. And, and broad and balanced as often means actually restricting choice, but for very good reasons. And that was, that was really well thought through. And I think sometimes we retreated from that. One of the consequences is that we give people more choice, for example, about pursuing modern languages, and what we've seen is a falling away of students doing modern languages. As an employee in a university, I know that that's now feeding into the number of people who want to do languages at university. That's got really significant consequences. That's a, that, that's, there are lots of complex reasons for it, but one of them is about opening up choice, I think, too early. So it's really important, it can sometimes feel a little unpopular, but it's really important to maintain breadth and balance and to make sure that we've got a, a richness and a diversity. The one thing I did want to say, in addition to that point, is just to recognise the achievement in this area of the fantastic tradition in relation to arts education that was a feature of the Leicester and Leicestershire arts. Many of us have children who benefited enormously from that experience. Um, and that's something that's come under threat in recent years, and we really ought to be uh, very uh, we, ought to be, we, ought, we ought to be more angry than we have been. So now I found the sciences, and I, I did a doctorate in chemistry, and uh, went on to be an academic in, 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 in what we call the hard sciences. They are very necessary, as is engineering, um, both for industry and also for a wide range of professions, be it veterinary science, um, medicine, and the rest But I remember when I had to choose, and when I went to school, I actually had to choose after O levels in which direction I would go. My twin brother, I did in good way, chose the arts. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to go with him anymore. So I chose the sciences. <laughs> well, I can't tell you how. What a wrench it was to give up things that I loved, like geography, history, English literature. And I have to say, throughout my sort of working, the first part of my working life, I felt as if I sort of part of me had gone because I had pursued the sciences. And when I sort of changed, I then started getting involved in the arts. I did a master's in creative writing. I chaired the County Council Arts Libraries and Museums Committee. And that sort of gave me that sort of balance back again, which I felt was missing. And I think we actually force our kids at a too early age to choose between the arts and the sciences. The sciences are great. They, they teach logic, they teach that sort of discipline. But the arts, I think, have got a lot about creativity, about opening the mind, about sort of that other side of the brain, which isn't really used when you're doing science. And that's what I think we ought to need for both of them. And I go to countries, and I've been to countries where they're focusing rigidly on the sciences, on, on the technical subjects, and I think they're missing out. And in fact, they're now starting to look to us for the creative industries. We've heard mention of the contribution that creative industries make to, to the economy. But it's not just what they make to the economy, it's what they make to life. Both of the people who are involved, but also the people who actually put on plays, put on theatre, put on poetry, put on the television, all those sort of aspects which enrich our life. And we lose that at our peril. So for me, the importance is that balance. And it's to say, the arts aren't soft subjects. They're as hard as the sciences, they're as difficult as the sciences, and they're as necessary as the sciences.
the, the arts in schools are league tables. Now, when Michael Gove introduced his EBAC and highlighted those five subjects, uh, what, sorry, what happened, and I can give you examples in Leicester, senior management, they're so obsessed by their position in the league tables now, they then have to focus on making things that score. And actually, the arts don't score very well in the, the systems that they're doing. So, for instance, two schools in Leicester City, which have thriving drama departments, 50 students opting to do GCSE drama. 12 months later, they were down to 20, because senior management were pushing kids into doing geography and history because they were going to score. Of course, that didn't eventually get introduced, actually, that lead back. But actually, you can see what, how management are operating. So, some of these systems that we have do have Sort of these sorts of outcomes. Mm -hmm. And support, basically, what she said, the reforms to the GCSEs are going to be catastrophic for the arts. The motivation of the GCSE drama, which is the practical, in, in the arts subjects, we have well developed over the years practical exams. They're very good, they're very rigorous. They're very, kids love them, they get motivated. They're going to now have to sit down and do a written paper for drama, PE. <coughs> Art, it's not applied for art. Art is the one subject which is allowed to still maintain its practical. Why not the others as well? There was uh, another gentleman who had his hand up as well. Just, yes, he's doing the glasses and they're great on. Uh, thanks. Um, my, uh, my wife does supply teaching around the local area and uh, in primary schools. It's been quite recently and it's been quite invaluable. Um, listening to what she's been saying at, you know, prior to obviously GCSEs um, and this kind of demand on very young kids you know you have, you have four and below to do uh, literacy maths literacy maths literacy maths literacy maths literacy maths um, even sometimes the promotion of their courses not courses but the subjects they do also have science so it's not almost a science versus arts and humanities, it's almost, you know, those, those core subjects versus all the rest. And it's not that I don't think the teachers or, or the schools want to deliver those things, but it's just the fact that there's so much pressure on them at that early stage that you see kids from perhaps more deprived areas struggling with that, even more so than giving a break, giving an opportunity to experience how good they are at other things. And it just seems quite a shocking situation even at that stage that they're placed in that position um, and goodness knows what they'll think of those subjects when they get older if they want to continue. Thank you very much indeed. Um